Okay, what we have over here <coughs> is uh, two tornadoes. Uh, in the center of a tornado, uh, one of the things that happens, you have to imagine that uh, that the atoms of, uh, or the molecules of uh, gases in a, uh, in a tornado are like um, two weights on the end of a spring. Uh, let's say a slinky, for instance. If we were to take it and spin it, uh, you're going to be able to predict that what's going to happen is it'll be, it'll be pulled apart by the centrifugal forces. Well, so what's happening inside a, a tornado is the, uh, the molecules of air are all being drawn apart by the uh, centrifugal forces, but there's also the ambient pressure of the, the, um, the atmosphere pressing in on it. So, uh, first of all, the, there is not necessarily a perfect vacuum in the center of a tornado. It depends on the wind speed. But um, what, it, what you end up getting is at least a reduction in pressure. In addition to that reduction in pressure, one of the things we have to keep in mind is what we see as a tornado is the funnel cloud. That is not the entire tornado. As you're very well aware, the area around the tornado is still damaging. So is the tornado just a little funnel cloud? No, it's not. That is a, a conception. What the funnel cloud is instead is the point at which the air, air pressure is so disturbed that we're, uh, it has a change of the uh, relative humidity and you're seeing some fog, etc. Uh, and so there is a kind of a boundary condition that is created so that we can actually think of uh, the tornado as this one thing. Now this is a good analogy to atoms. In, in other words, an atom can be seen as this one singular thing, but is it really that one singular thing or is that boundary just sort of something we keep up with ourselves because yeah, there's a, a point of rapid change happening. That's what we have, the point of rapid change at the edges of the funnel, but the actual tornado itself continues out from there and there's actually a reduction of air pressure around the tornadoes as well. So, in other words, the, it's a gradient of air pressure. Now, if you look at these numbers here, I don't know if you can read them, but basically they have 10, 20, 30, 40 going out from, uh, from them. So, in other words, the air pressure is increasing as we go away from the tornadoes. So, one of the things that also happens with tornadoes is they tend to be, once they get close enough to each other, they tend to be drawn into each other's uh, area and combined into one tornado. Um, this can happen because of the fact, well, so why are they drawn towards each other? They're actually drawn towards each other by force, the force of buoyancy. Uh, now, you know, typically we think of buoyancy as a um, as something that happens in water, but it is only uh, it's only because water is our only example of buoyancy. Buoyancy exists because of a gradient of pressures. So now, let me uh, make a quick drawing here. So, in, in a, a uh, in an ocean, uh, we take a balloon, and um, if we have it underwater, it's going upwards. Well, why is this? Well, the point is that water has different pressures as you go down. And there's a very minute change in pressure as you go further and further down. And the balloon is across those pressures. So this means that there's more pressure at the bottom of the balloon than there is at the top of the balloon. So well, the only thing that's happening is this balloon ends up going towards the area of least pressure, of least resistance. So that's why it goes up. And you'll find that in space, a bubble placed in some water can just float there, right in the center of the water, and it won't go anywhere because there's not a gradient of pressure to cause it to go in any particular direction. So, why are these tornadoes drawn towards each other? Because there's a gradient of pressures. As you get closer to the, the uh, center of the vortex, you have lower pressure. As you get further away, it goes higher pressure. Once they're drawn in towards each other, basically the pressure on the total outside, let's say this is 40 everywhere, I don't know why 40, but that just happens to be the number I've come up with. And all the way on the, on the outside, all around those tornadoes, there's that 40 pressure pushing in, but closer to each other, once they've entered each other's area, well, there's only 30 here, so each of them are going towards the lower pressure. So they're drawn towards each other in a fashion that is, uh, is actually could be called buoyancy. The same thing is what's happening with ether vortices. A, an ether vortex, we see this specific little... Uh, area that we consider the atom itself, but there's an area in effect around the atom that is also part of the atom, and it's just like the, this area, this gradient of pressure around the tornado, there's a gradient of ether pressure around each atom. This gradient of ether pressure means that once one atom comes in the, uh, the field of another atom, they're drawn together because of the exterior pressure of the ether, they're drawn together because of buoyancy. And this is what gravity is. Now, of course, you uh, add this up, you have a lot of atoms all disturbing the medium around them, and you have a lower density of ether in that specific area. And the larger the, uh, the set of atoms, the more they are capable of working together to create a low-pressure area around it. So what you have is like a planet, for instance, has a 
tremendous amount of atoms all making the, uh, the ether, local ether pressure extremely low uh, because of the way in which they, they churn up and disturb the, uh, the ether itself. And so you have a, uh, a field all the way around a planet that is lower pressure of ether. Now this uh, leads to a lot of different things. Now um, this theory, for the most part, is capable of explaining most phenomenon um, in modern science. Uh, the one thing that differs is this, this theory, uh, ether theory, is completely incompatible with uh, with uh, relativistic physics. Um, well, not entirely completely uh, incompatible. It's only incompatible with uh, the second postulate of relativity. And it is, in fact, compatible with Lorentz ether physics. And now Lorentz uh, was responsible for the Lorentz transformation. And uh, it, it was actually called Lorentz ether, uh, excuse me, Lorentz Einstein relativity uh, during the early stages of relativity. So here's the thing. Anything that is ether and uh, 18th century physics is not compatible with modern uh, assumptions of relativity. So why did I bring this up? Because if we have the, uh, the ether pressure around, a, um, around something being lower, well then the speed of light is actually going to be different. So in other words, what I'm saying is that near a planet where there is a uh, different pressure than further away, light is going to travel slower. Now this actually does explain a lot of the effects that are explained by, that are supposedly the only explanation is through general relativity or um, special relativity. And that is, for instance, that time will actually happen faster uh, in an area where there, there's more pressure. So that, that means time will occur faster now out in uh, outer space. So let's get to the ideas of time, et cetera. All right, there's uh, something that, that happens uh, called the anomalous, uh, the anomalous acceleration of Pioneer 10 and 11. Uh, what's happening is we sent Pioneer 10 and 11 out to the edges of our solar system, and uh, they actually seem to, be, uh, they seem to be slowing down. Uh, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, unless, of course, the, uh, what, what's happening is the speed of light is different in between here and there. If the speed of light is different in between here and there, then although they're going the same speed, they will appear to send the, the light will actually return faster than we expect because the, uh, the ether pressure is greater. And so, therefore, this, uh, this explanation of uh, greater ether pressure and different uh, speeds of light in uh, different areas actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, for explaining this phenomenon, which is not yet explained in physics. All right, so we're uh, saying that um, the ether pressure near a planet is lower than the ether pressure further away from the planet. Now, this will actually, um, or any gravitational body, of course, uh, so the sun and the Earth and all of these things all, all change the ambient ether pressure in the area around the solar system, the area around the moon, the, the Earth, etc. So that means light will travel slightly different speeds in these areas. Um, this actually will uh, give us an explanation for what is called gravitational lensing. And uh, gravitational lensing is when light travels past the star, it actually gets bent. Uh, in, uh, in mediums, uh, sound will actually bend around areas that where, uh, like for instance, when you look at a mirage, what's happening is because of the heat coming up off the ground, uh, the, the heat is changing the property of the air so that it changes the way that light will travel through it. Uh, the same thing will happen with, with any wave. When it travels through a medium and, and it, the speed is changed, it will actually cause it to deflect in one direction or another. Uh, if we uh, have the, the idea of that ether is uh, less dense near a planet, it will actually cause light to deflect in exactly the way that we see in modern physics. So uh, that's very interesting. Uh, in addition to that, the idea that ether pressure is greater further away from a, a planet than it is closer to a planet, uh, and that gravity is an effective buoyancy, also explains GPS clocks. Now, GPS the clocks on uh, GPS satellites actually run faster. Uh, this is uh, something that they have to consider whenever uh, they're, they're making the, uh, the GPS system, is that the clocks will run faster. Now, why is it they would run faster? As I said before, the wave speed in a medium has to do with its pressure. So if there's greater pressure in outer space, then the speed of light is increased. So therefore, any clock which is based upon a, a you know, a, well, it's, it's based upon revolutions. It's based, based upon waves. It's based upon uh, cycles. And so the cycles, which are governed by the uh, electromagnetic uh, interactions, uh, or governed by the speed of light will of course happen faster, so therefore time will seem to occur faster in space and the clocks on the GPS satellites will run 
faster because the ether pressure is greater in space. Uh, so what does all this mean uh, for you science fiction writers? Uh, well, first of all, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that uh, general relativity and special relativity gave us was some neat magic stuff. Uh, in other words, we could travel backwards through time. Time was something we could travel through. Now, here in, uh, in this mechanical view of reality where there's no magic, uh, it kind of uh, breaks that up. It makes it such that time is just our perception of events happening around us. It's a perception, just like a perception of a wave. A wave isn't something that can exist on its own. It is an event, just like going for a run is an event. It is not something in and of itself. You can't hold a run in your hand. You can go for a run. Uh, same thing is true with, uh, with time. In other words, it is an event, not something that exists somewhere in some magical place. Uh, time is our perception of the change of things happening around us. It's electromagnetic interaction. So therefore, there's no way to travel into the past except to undo every electromagnetic interaction in the universe. And I'm sorry, that's just absurd. Uh, so, since you can't travel backwards in time, we need to have some sort of mechanism that's fun for writing. And uh, one of the things that is a favorite of the uh, ancient philosophy, etc., is that time goes in loops. So, one of the things we can do instead to, uh, to make up for this, this loss of the magic of time travel is we can instead have time travel go in a forward direction only. And uh, when it go, when we, so we, if we want to go to the past, what we'll have to do is travel far enough into the future that time has started over again. We've actually ended up in the another point in the loop just before where we started. So it's kind of like if I wanted to end up behind me, I could travel all the way around the Earth and end up behind me. Um, so this is a, 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 a workaround for time travel to, uh, but what also happens is there's no paradoxes. It's impossible to create a paradox in this system. Uh, one of the uh, effects of an ether-based 18th century set of, uh, of physics is that it is absolutely impossible to have magical effects and it is absolutely impossible to have paradoxes because paradox, paradoxes are illogical. Uh, so since we have no paradoxes, for instance, um, if you attempt to travel to the past, uh, where you'll end up is actually seeing another copy of yourself. You'll be able to meet this other copy of yourself and impact their life, but it is a complete other copy of yourself that is in the future if you happen to travel to the past. Now, if you travel to the future, just your own future, in other words, I simply walk forward a little bit and don't go all the way through the loop of time, which is, you know, who knows, millions of years or whatever you want to make it. Um, it could be what, what's the processionary period of the Earth? Uh, I don't know, 24,000 years, something like that. Whatever. Um, so if you want to um, just simply travel forward, what's going to happen is you're not going to you're not going to encounter yourself in the future uh, if you haven't traveled all the way to another set of the loop. Instead, what you're going to encounter is a world in which you disappeared at the point you began to time travel. Um, so basically. Zero paradoxes. It's impossible to travel in the past. Um, one of the things that you can do with this, however, is have time effects. So what I mean by time effects is that all you need to do is change the speed of light, and that can be done by changing the, e the ambient ether pressure. So what I mean by this, for instance, is if I were to uh, say I'm some sort of time agent, etc., in your in your book, one of the things I could do is uh, put somebody in a stasis field. Now, in a stasis field, what I mean by this is that I make the ether in the area that they're in extremely uh, rarefied. And so what happens is by expanding the ether in their area, the speed of light is very, very slow. And so what happens is to them, they'll feel like they're traveling into the future, but instead what's happened is I've just simply slowed down their time. Now, all the rest of us are experiencing time as normal because the speed of light is normal because our ambient ether pressure is the same as it's been the entire time. To them, they'll be looking out and we're running around really, really fast. And to, to us, when we look inside their bubble, they're actually moving extremely slow or almost stopped to, to uh, our perceptions. However, they will continue to be moving forward very slowly. Uh, another effect that we can have is uh, do the opposite. We can compress the ether in an area. By compressing the ether in area, what we've done is we've sped up the speed of light. So the light will happen extremely fast. So anything inside that bubble that we have created and where it's compressed, time will happen very fast. Uh, well, it will happen much more quickly than the area around it. So, for instance, if we were to compress a, a bubble, we could cause a uh, take take some grape juice, stick it in that bubble, and pull, pull it back out seconds later and have it aged 
20 years. Now, of course, if you stick your hand in there, the same thing might happen. You don't really want that. But the idea is there are time effects that we can have by simply compressing or rarefying ether, and there's some interesting, fun, magical type of things we can do with that.